G'day, Mort's here. Today I'm going to talk about the importance of canteens, what an incredibly important invention it is. And then I'm going to uh, refurbish an old uh, second-hand canteen that I've had for many years and it's uh, had a hard life, so I'm going to make it as good as a new one. And then at the end I've got two questions for you. So hang around and we'll have a good day. Just a quick edit, this is going to be part one of probably at least three parts. Started as a bit of a commentary uh, to a company me restoring a water bottle. I've looked at it and there's a fair bit more of me waffling on than intended, so welcome to part one. G'day, so like I said, we're going to talk about water bottles today, or canteens. We're going to talk about the uh, historical importance of them and the philosophy, because I think they're overlooked and unsung. And then I'm going to do a restoration on an old uh, aluminium or aluminium water bottle. My name's Mort. I'm an average Joe guy that likes to knock around in the bush, have fun, fun in the scrub. And I like to do a lot of those preparations myself. I like to play with equipment as well, and like a lot of old-fashioned techniques. To me, it's all about regaining a, a sense of self-ownership. And, yeah, people call it survival, self-reliance, and all these sort of swanky names. But, really, it, it is. It's just fun in the bush. That, uh, Well, I've had situations where I've been thankful for it um, as well. Uh, as in almost emergency situations that would have been emergencies if I hadn't had a preparedness and a self-reliance mindset. So, as uh, some people on the internet would say, it's taken from a survival situation to inconvenient camping, or indeed ex extricating yourself from that. So yeah, like I said, my name's Mort, welcome aboard. Uh, if you like what you see, uh, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe, and uh, let me know what, what, what you want to see more of. So yeah, anyway, we're all familiar with the, uh, or many of us, the, the five C's of survivability. When you're building a kit for self-reliance, you want to start with a minimum five items, and you can move on to a, an additional five. Now, that those five items are really five categories. Uh, they all start with a C. Uh, Dave Canterbury in Ohio, in the United States of America, he codified this, and we have much to thank him for for this. Those five C's are cordage, combustion devices, cutting tools, covering and a container and it comes down to the things that are the hardest to replace or hardest to, to make from the natural environment and those things that uh, most greatly affect your survivability through the night uh, or you know through an extended period and he'd also studied and looked at various long distance explorers in the 1800s who kept journals at what things they hung on to the longest. You know, to survive, they'd traded with, with natives and indigenous people, but the things that they hung on to longest tended to be rope, cutting tools like knives, axes, and saws, cooking containers, blankets, and tents, there's your covering and their fire lighting implements. They also hung on to their firearms as long as they typically could as well. So anyway, the, uh, the container, excuse me, the container is a pretty unromantic item. It, it is cooking pots, billy cans, water bottles, canteens, things like that. Certainly unglamorous. But let's look at what that actually means. At its barest minimum, it's the ability to carry water. But beyond that, as we say, billy cans, um, canteens and all that, the ability to boil water to sterilise it. Yes, you can sterilise water by chemical means, but it's not permanently sustainable because you're not going to find uh, iodine or other types of tablets or potassium permanganate in the bush. You will find the capacity to light fires, so if you've got a container, you can sterilise your water. Now, let's look even before sterilising water, how long could a person survive without the capacity to carry water? 
Well, let's picture trying to explore a, a continent or indeed just being a, a, an indigenous group of people without the ability to go more than two hours walk from a known water source. That's not very far. Now I say two hours, people say, well, you can live th for three days without water. Sure, let's explore that. The rule of threes, as they say, three minutes without oxygen. Now, three seconds without security when you need it, three minutes without oxygen, three hours on a rainy hillside in the winter without covering. They say three days without water and three weeks without food. Well, we know people can live for more than three weeks without food because um, they used to fast for 40 days quite often, so there's six weeks. But three weeks, if you're working really, really hard or trying to sleep through cold nights, sure, three weeks might pull you up, as well as uh, psychological reasons coupled to that. If you just give up on life, as Viktor Frankl would say, and this fails, then yeah, okay, you're dead in three weeks without food. But three days without water. I can tell you from personal experience that depending on the ambient temperature and your work level, you can go from adequately hydrated to unconscious and approaching dead within three hours. Very easily, I've done it personally. I, when I was a, a young punk 18 year old recruit, I, uh, I went down with heat in that in less than three hours, I've gone from normal good life to unconscious in an ambulance in hospital, unconscious for three, uh, for a day and a half and I actually think I got some brain damage I don't know if it was permanent or not but uh, the old Dane Bramage in that I went back to where I grew up and although people were familiar to me I couldn't remember anybody's name even though it hadn't even been very long since I'd seen them and I grew up with them um, yeah there's a whole story wrapped up around that and let me know in the comments down below if you were uh, want to hear more I, I could talk for hours about heat casualties and uh, and I've dealt with several as well uh, the, the other people that have gone down with heat uh, when I did that it was in the 1990s and it was seen as a uh, a symbol of being a bit bit of an idiot being a bit lazy being a bit weak and to make it worse we had a, a reporter from my hometown newspaper that was watching me going down and you know gradually becoming slower and weaker and becoming unconscious and it was painted in a, a mocking phrase not not as a desperate battle and proof that my brain was stronger than my body no now it's published in a full color center center spread on the the saturday special edition of the newspaper and when i marched into my unit there it was pinned up uh in the the mess which is sort of like uh I don't know what you'd call it, a canteen, a tuck shop, which happens to also sell beer, um, the other ranks mess, where the corporals and privates and that hung out. And then later on I went somewhere for advanced infantry training and all those instructors knew about it too. So, yeah, thanks to that reporter. I think it's more because I avoided her having remembered what damage reporters did in the Vietnam War. I actually lost a um, much beloved mate, uh, an old friend who transferred to the British Army and he was doing uh, certain activities in the mountains of Wales and he and three others died from a, a heat wave that had hit Wales they were you know hydrated that morning but I think 23 were hospitalized and uh, three died including my mate and trust me he was not unfit so that's how it was viewed back in the 90s. My mate died only two years ago, two or three years ago. But yeah, back in the 90s, it was a symbol of, uh, of considered to be that uh, of a lazy and weak person. Whereas it's been learnt now that it's the determined person who refuses to give up uh, and their mind's stronger than their body. Uh, in a similar vein, in Special Forces Selection in Australia, I understand that your camelbacks and other hydration bladders being super high speed and low drag, they're actually banned for selection because on the instances where they've burst, guys have not wanted to say so. They've been out of water 
and they've actually gone down with heat stroke and they've lost very good selection candidates because of that. So, from what I'm told, it's these and these only. Good old plastic Vietnam era canteens that are still issued. But anyway, there's a whole lot I could probably make two to four hours worth of video about heat casualties and it's worth doing but suffice to say you can go down with heat and be dead within three hours easily without like without water so carrying water is really really important you can imagine the the gamble uh, of early humanity of chasing a wounded animal or just wanting to see what's on the other side of a mountain range um, without the ability to carry water it would have been huge. So the water bottle enabled exploration and, and freed us from having to handrail ourselves up and down creeks. However, we're domesticated and we do need to treat the water. And as I said, treating it by a chemical, that's fine for you know, a couple of days, depending on how, many, how much supplies of chemicals you have, whether it's chlorine, iodine, potassium permanganate, and any of the others. Uh, filters, filters are great. They do have a lifespan, but uh, yeah, it's pretty huge. Uh, I don't carry a filter everywhere, but I do have a water bottle everywhere I go. So we come to the metal water bottle. Right, oh, so does anybody have any final questions or doubtful points on what I've discussed so far in this video? Just joking, this is getting to the end of uh, part one. So, as, as we all say, don't forget to like comment share subscribe all that sort of thing especially if you want to catch part two uh, so hopefully i'll catch you soon when i upload the next one cheers